Hello, my name is Tony, and today we're going to look at another horrible case with you. Usually, small towns in Illinois are considered safe enough that people don't even lock their doors at night. Beeson, Illinois was no exception. However, everything changed in 2009 when the bodies of five family members were discovered brutally murdered. This is the heartbreaking tale of the G family murders. Let's start by getting to know the G family. Raymond Rick G was born in Decatur in 1963. In 1997, he married Ruth and Constant in Beeson, Illinois. They became a big blended family, with Rick's three children from a previous relationship and Ruth and his children, Justina and Dylan Constant. Justina was only four years old, and Dylan was just two when their parents got married. Together, Rick and Ruth then had a son named Austin in 1998. They later had a daughter named Jessica, who unfortunately suffered a severe brain injury and had to be placed in the care of the Department of Children and Family Services as a ward of the state. In 2006, their family grew again with the birth of their daughter Tabitha. As time went on, Rick's adult children moved forward into adulthood, even started their own families. His daughter Nicole married Christopher Harris and had a daughter in the late 1990s. Although their relationship had its ups and downs, and eventually resulted in a divorce. They eventually reconciled by 2009 and welcomed a son into the family. No one knew that this family was about to be shattered. On the fateful day of September 21, 2009, the world turned upside down for Rick's family. Rick's stepfather, growing increasingly concerned when Rick failed to appear at his workplace, decided to pay the family a visit. Little did he know that what awaited him behind those doors would be a scene straight out of a nightmare. As he stepped into the G home in Beeson, Illinois, a chilling silence engulfed him. The air was heavy with an eerie stillness, as if the house itself held its breath, bracing for the unspeakable tragedy that had unfolded within its walls. Panic gripped Rick's stepfather, and with trembling hands, he reached for his phone and dialed 911, desperate for help. Within moments, the police and emergency medical services descended upon the scene, their hearts heavy with dread. What they encountered was a sight that would haunt them forever. The once peaceful abode had been transformed into a macabre tableau of bloodshed and terror. The walls bore witness to a gruesome crime, a canvas painted with the darkest shades of human cruelty. Five lifeless bodies lay before them, each one a victim of a merciless bludgeoning. Rick, 46, Ruthen, 39, Justina, 16, Dylan, 14, and Austin, 11, had all been bludgeoned to death and were all deceased. Amidst this sea of tragedy, a glimmer of hope emerged. Three-year-old Tabitha, the lone survivor, was found alive but severely injured, with a fractured skull and arm. She was airlifted to a hospital in Peoria, Illinois, where she was placed in protective custody. Who would want to harm the G's? That was the question posed to the investigators. In a press conference just days after the bodies were discovered, Sheriff Steve Nichols stated, We're not going to quit. Families in the small town of 250 were told to keep their doors locked and to be on the lookout. Many people were worried that this could happen to their family. People were terrified because there was no obvious motive. Rick had recently started his own construction company after working for his stepfather previously. Ruth and stayed at home with her children. The family had no known enemies and was far from wealthy. Justina was a typical 16-year-old starting high school and dating. Dylan competed in wrestling for his middle school team. Austin was a typical 11-year-old sports fan. What could possibly motivate someone to murder nearly an entire family? Investigators discovered blood pools and smears on the front porch deck. As descriptions provided by investigators and the medical examiner provided information, Rick was discovered face down on the living room floor, with blood pooling and splattering on the ceiling, floors, and walls. He'd been hit in the head at least 13 times. Ruth was discovered in the couple's bedroom, having been struck 13 times with such force that her skull collapsed over her right eye. Dylan lay in the doorway to a bedroom, having been hit more than 30 times. Austin was discovered in the bathroom, having been struck eight times and having both sides of his skull caved in. Tabitha was discovered on her bedroom floor and had been struck twice in the head. 
her right ear's skin had been peeled back. As Logan County Sheriff's Corporal Michael Block and Illinois State Trooper Paul Hennessy swept the home, they discovered that G's computer was missing. Block noticed movement from Tabitha and yelled for paramedics. Without a moment's hesitation, the paramedic swiftly cradled Tabitha in his arms, racing against time as he navigated through the labyrinthine corridors towards the awaiting ambulance. With urgency in their hearts, they whisked her away to the nearest hospital, but the severity of her condition demanded more than just local care. Thus, she was swiftly airlifted to the prestigious Trauma Level 1 hospital in Peoria, Illinois. The gravity of Tabitha's injuries became painfully apparent as a doctor meticulously examined her. The doctor determined she had multiple skull fractures with brain swelling. She could not speak and because of the swelling from injuries to her face, she could not see, Tabitha could move her arm. In a desperate bid to alleviate the mounting pressure on her brain, the doctors made the difficult decision to remove fragments of her skull, a necessary sacrifice for the sake of healing. During the investigation of the crime scene a bloody handprint was discovered on the vanity in the bathroom where Austin was murdered. As the investigators ventured outside, their eyes fell upon a fresh, undisturbed shoe print, imprinted with a sense of urgency. It was a case with tennis shoe, its aggressive tread leaving an indelible mark on the ground. A shiver ran down their spines, for they knew that this was a crucial clue that could lead them closer to the heart of darkness. With unwavering determination, the officers embarked on a relentless pursuit of justice, they went door to door in the small town. Whispers of information began to trickle in, as concerned citizens shared their suspicions with the authorities. Each tip was treated with utmost urgency, as the police wasted no time in following up on every lead. Neighbors told investigators that they saw a primer gray pickup truck with unusual exhaust pipes coming up through the bed of the truck at the house early on September 21st. The truck appears to be the only clue to this mystery, and others in the community quickly recognize it. The G family was laid to rest on September 28th, before a suspect was identified. Eventually, a random encounter at the hospital where Tabitha was being treated provided a big break. Because Tabitha had survived the attack, police kept her under surveillance as a precaution. Christopher Harris, the husband of Rick's daughter Nicole, came to see Tabitha, at the same time that Christopher Harris left Tabitha's room, an officer was leaving his shift. Nicole, his estranged wife, had stayed by Tabitha's bedside since she arrived. The officer noticed Harris's shoes were K-Swiss with aggressive tread while Harris and the officer were riding the elevator. The officer reported what he had discovered to detectives. This prompted them to call Harris for questioning. They took a print of his shoe tread and discovered that it was a half size too large. They also collected fingerprints and palm prints, which were then sent to a crime lab for analysis. Jason Harris, Christopher Harris's brother, provided the alibi, claiming that they were out together but not near Beeson. When the evidence came back, it positively identified the handprint from the bathroom as belonging to Christopher Harris. Christopher Harris, 30 years old, was arrested and charged with five counts of first-degree murder, attempted murder, and several other charges in connection with the G family murders on October 1, 2009. Christopher had been living across the street from the G's with his ex-wife, Nicole G., Rick's daughter. Nicole initially defended Harris's innocence because she never imagined him capable of such violence. All of this is such a mess and it's not right at all, Nicole wrote on her MySpace page. Now not only has my children lost five very close family members but their daddy is being set up and taken away. This is too much, but later, she changed her mind in light of the overwhelming evidence. Following the arrest, many people were taken aback. He did not commit the crime. The family is trying to hire a lawyer from Chicago because he didn't do this, said Jennifer Ernest, the girlfriend of Chris's brother Jason. It wasn't very long before others were quickly arrested, including Jason Harris, Jennifer Ernest, and Jennifer's mother, Sarah Duncan. The three were charged with obstructing justice. However, the following day, Jason Harris was charged with murder and attempted murder. The Harris brothers were charged with over 50 counts on October 28th including murder, attempted murder, home invasion, residential robbery, and criminal sexual assault. Ernest and Duncan were charged with fabricating alibis, setting fire to clothing, concealing a laptop computer, and lying to police. At this point, 
one of the brothers cracked and confessed to his involvement in the crime. In exchange for a reduced sentence, Jason Harris testified against his brother as a state's witness and provided the following account. The night of the crime, as Jason Harris told investigators, he and Chris were out drinking, smoking weed, and doing lines of cocaine. He claimed they had attempted, but failed, to hook up with some girls his brother knew. And they decided to go to the G's house at that point. According to Jason, the reason for going to the G house was to talk to and possibly hook up with Justina Constant. Jason later stated that they also went to Rick Constant's house to buy weed and steal a computer. Jason continued, when Christopher got out of the truck, he grabbed a tire iron and walked into the house. Jason stated that he spent the entire time in the pickup. Jason heard several loud thumps and screams coming from the house. He saw Dylan jump out of a bedroom window, then make his way to the front door and re-enter the house. But a few moments later, Dylan came running back out of the house, bleeding profusely, with Christopher Harris following him behind. Jason saw his brother hit Dylan with the tire iron five or six times before returning to the house. Dylan, to his surprise, rose to his feet and returned inside the house. Harris left the house and got into the pickup a few minutes later. Harris threw his shoes and tire iron out the window as they drove down the country road. Then, he finally confessed to the heinous act of furnishing Chris with a fabricated alibi and deliberately hiding crucial evidence. Adding fuel to the fire, Jennifer Ernest, who happens to share a child with Jason, and her own mother, Sarah Duncan, were not innocent bystanders either. They actively participated in the destruction of evidence and shamelessly provided a false alibi. Prosecutors noted that an attempted sexual assault charge against Christopher Harris in relation to Justina had been dismissed a week prior to the time of the murder. Jason said Christopher went to the G house for sexual reasons, which did not occur. Investigators carried out a search warrant at Jason Harris's home, which was also where Christopher had been staying since his divorce from Nicole. They noticed Harris's pickup in the driveway, which matched the description given by the witnesses. There were no exhaust pipes in the bed but investigators discovered a weight rack behind a newly placed shed. It would create the appearance of exhaust pipes, and G's missing computer was discovered in the pickup's bed, hidden beneath a tarp. The investigators also drove the route described by Jason Harris. Beyond the roadside ditch, and you wouldn't believe what they have found. The case was shoes and tire iron were discovered. A DNA match between the G family and Christopher Harris was discovered by forensics. The pieces of the puzzle began to fall into place in this gripping mystery and intrigue story. The sinister implications of these discoveries appeared large, casting a dark shadow over the unfolding story. The stage was set for a dramatic clash in which the truth would be revealed and justice would be served. As time passed, the town of Beeson had to move forward while awaiting the murder trials of Christopher and Jason Harris. Tabitha G., who had recovered from her injuries, was placed in foster care while a custody case between her grandmother and the Department of Children and Family Services was pending. Despite the tragedy, the tight-knit community of Beeson came together to support one another. In a heartfelt gesture, the town decided to build a playground in memory of the children, naming it the G Constant Memorial Playground. Meanwhile, Sarah Duncan was sentenced to 24 months of probation and a $2,500 fine for obstructing justice. The fate of the remaining suspects would not be decided until 2013. As I mentioned earlier, in exchange for a plea deal, Jason Harris agreed to testify against his brother. So Christopher Harris was the first to stand trial in 2013. Christopher Harris used a self-defense claim during his trial. He said that he walked into the G home around 1 a.m. on September 21, 2009, and found Dylan Constant in the act of murdering his family. According to Christopher, he had no choice but to defend himself and ended up killing Dylan. To support his claim, Dr. Craig Anderson, a professor at Iowa State University, testified as an expert witness. Dr. Anderson shed some light on Dylan's background. He said, apparently, this 14-year-old kid had a lot going on. He displayed antisocial behavior, had low intelligence, struggled in school, and came from a broken home. And he also stated, it's worth mentioning that Dylan once allegedly said, I can't wait for the school to blow up after failing a test. But no matter how hard his defense tried to argue with their side of the story there was an overwhelming contradictory story about Dylan, B. 
because several teachers had a different story to tell. They claimed that Dylan wasn't a violent troublemaker. Sure, he got into some hot water for not turning in assignments, but that's about it. The defense also pointed to violent video games found in Dylan's room, such as Mortal Kombat. During the trial, researchers discussed studies that found a link between violent video games and violent behavior. Dylan had a history of behavioral health treatment. The defense blamed Dylan alone for the deaths of the rest of the G family. Christopher Harris found himself in a real pickle when he stumbled upon Dylan Constant committing a heinous act. It's up to the court to decide whether his self-defense claim holds water. And with Dr. Anderson's testimony and conflicting accounts from teachers, things got pretty interesting in that courtroom. The trial continued, as Assistant Attorney General Steve planned, Jason Harris testified against his brother Christopher, recounting his confession and the events surrounding the murder of the G family. The motive was now primarily presented as robbery, with the stolen computer as evidence. Investigators explained, however, that the computer was linked to cameras in the house, which would have revealed who killed the family if the computer had not been destroyed. Jason testified that his brother told him he murdered the family so he wouldn't leave any witnesses. Christopher Harris was found guilty on all charges. Christopher's sentencing hearing began on July 19, 2013. Tabitha G's impact statement was nothing short of heartbreaking. I am seven years old, and it still breaks my heart, and I wish you were dead and my brothers and sisters, as well as my mother and father, were alive, she said in a written statement. She went on, you don't sneak up on other people. You have to say sorry because, do you know how badly that broke my heart? Chris Harris maintained his innocence. Nicole G stated that she and her children no longer supported her ex-husband and wanted nothing to do with him. Finally, Christopher Harris was sentenced to five consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole, plus 80 years, for attempted murder, robbery, and home invasion. As part of his plea agreement, Jason Harris's murder charge was dropped. He pleaded guilty to homicide concealment, delivery of a controlled substance, and obstruction of justice. He was sentenced to 20 years in prison with credit for the time served for his role in the murders. Jennifer Ernest pleaded guilty to obstructing justice in September 2013 and was sentenced to 24 months of probation, 120 days in Logan County Jail, a $1,000 fine, and 100 hours of community service. The town of Beeson has had to deal with this tragedy as a community. The G family sought the assistance of the Beeson Fire Department in 2014. The Beeson Fire Department burned down the G home with the approval of the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency. The controlled fire represented a fresh start for the town and an opportunity to put the brutal murder behind them. However, the victims are remembered, and the G Constant Memorial Park honors them. Tabitha G now lives with her grandmother and is working to overcome the tragedy that changed her life forever and nearly killed her. Christopher Harris's appeals were denied, and he is now incarcerated at the Pontiac Correctional Facility. Nicole G later divorced and remarried. She eventually lost custody of her children after being charged with multiple drug offenses as well as allegations of abuse and neglect. Nobody knows why Christopher Harris and Jason Harris went to the G house that night. It's difficult to understand how anyone could commit such a heinous and violent crime against people they knew and considered family. It's beyond disturbing that a three-year-old child could be beaten and left for dead for no apparent reason. But it did happen. It happened in a small town that was thought to be safe. This story highlights the unsettling fact that murder occurs everywhere. In my opinion, both Chris and Jason share equal responsibility for the gruesome crime. While Chris may have been more directly accountable for the act itself, Jason is equally responsible because he failed to prevent Chris from committing the murder. Instead of covering it up for his brother, Jason could have at least reported the crime and testified as soon as possible. It is important to note that justice has been served in this case. Chris will spend the rest of his life in prison, and Jason will also face a lengthy sentence. This outcome ensures that they are held accountable for their actions. Overall, it is clear that both individuals played a role in this tragic event. Their actions have had severe consequences, and they will now have to face the legal repercussions for their choices. This story highlights the inconvenient truth that murder happens everywhere. Hey, what's your take on this case? Do you reckon the punishments they got are fair? 
or should they be punished more? Let me know what you think in the comments. Tony was with you, and thanks for watching. Subscribe to the channel and don't forget to click the bell to stay up to date on the biggest stories from around the world. I'll see you soon. Take care.